Uh, my name is David Siddharth Patel. I'm a senior fellow at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at uh, Sunny Brandeis University. And uh, I'd like to start by turning things over to Gary Seymour, the Crown Family Director of the Crown Center. Uh, Gary? Thank you very much, David. I'm Gary Seymour, Director of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies. I want to welcome all of you to our first virtual seminar of the new academic year. Uh, given COVID restrictions, we're going to continue to operate on a virtual basis. We have one uh, seminar uh, every month, so three more to come. And I encourage you to join and tell your colleagues and friends. So we have an opportunity to bring you high quality uh, academic research on the Middle East. Uh, I'm gonna turn things over to David Patel now who will moderate our first session with Professor Glenn Robinson of the Naval uh, Postgraduate School in Monterey, who has just published a book on global jihad appropriate for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So David and Glenn, over to you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Glenn Robinson, as Gary mentioned, is from the Naval Postgraduate School in uh, Monterey, almost as Monterey, California, almost as sunny as Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, Glenn has authored or co-authored four books on the Middle East, uh, on Middle East politics, most uh, perhaps interesting for this audience uh, before this book, a, a number of pieces on building a Palestinian state, the challenges and opportunities of building a Palestinian state, and dozens of journal articles. He's worked closely with both USAID and DOD on various development and political challenges in the Middle East. And he's a founding board member and treasurer for the Association for Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Studies, of which the Crown Center is an institutional member. Um, I'm going to put a link to his uh, webpage, which has his full bio and a lot of his publications in the chat. So how we're going to go today is we're going to run from 11 to 12.15. Glenn, uh, we've asked to speak for 20 to 25 minutes, and that should leave us plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, we don't have a discussant, but I'll ask a question or two to kick us off. Any questions you have for the speaker, please ask them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, hover your cursor browser down at the bottom and it'll pop up. The chat room is open, but panelists will not be monitoring the chat. Members of the Crown Center staff will be, but again, if you have questions for the speaker, we request that you submit them via the Q&A button and not in the chat. Uh, closed captioning for this webinar is available uh, and the session is being recorded. Uh, so without further ado, please, Glenn Robinson. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David and Gary, for that uh, uh, kind introduction. And thanks uh, to the Crown Center at Brandeis uh, for the invitation to speak, even if it has to be digital, um, you know, so be it. It's a, it's a real honor and a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I have about a dozen or so slides, so I'm going to share the screen and we'll go through them quickly. As David said, I'll talk for just 20 or 25 minutes till about 11.30 and uh, then have a discussion thereafter. Um, all right, so you should all see these, uh, these slides now. Um, as uh, David and Gary mentioned, I have recently, just earlier this year, published a book um, that is an interpretive history uh, of global jihad. Uh, in the book, I make two arguments and basically I'll lay them out briefly today as well. The, the primary argument is an interpretive analysis, an interpretive argument about how to understand the different forms of global jihad. Um, and I make this distinction between global and local jihad where global jihadis see a systemic uh, uh, international problem as being the, the, the basis uh, for action. And of course they have very different um, views of what that is and I'll, I'll get through that. And I argue that there have been four distinct since the 1980s, since uh, this phenomenon began, there have been four distinct iterations, or I call waves in the book, um, of, uh, of global jihad. So that's the first argument. We'll go through each of those four iterations, uh, and again, fairly quickly. Um, and then I ask the question, how, how do we understand this violent political movement um, in a sort of broader universe of violent political movements? Uh, how do we understand it? And here I make comparisons um, to a number of different um, uh, violent political movements and make an argument drawing on Ken Jowett's work from the 1990s, make an argument about uh, movements of rage, which 
it can be both secular and religious based. Uh, and that'll be the second uh, argument that I will make today. So uh, in the book, of course, you, you have to have context. So I do begin um, in the very first chapter uh, looking at the rise of political Islam in the 20th century. Some of you will recognize Hassan al-Banna at the top there, the founder of the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. I make the point that the Muslim Brotherhood has been primarily a nonviolent movement. And it's, it's not that they are peaceniks, but that um, violence is not a cornerstone of their, uh, of their program. Sometimes it's called for, but it's not an essential element of their program. Uh, I talk about the rise of the jihadi offshoot in the 60s and 70s uh, and make the case that it, it's the issue of violence that is the main separator between Islamists and jihadists, where jihadists, both local and global, view uh, violent action as utterly essential to advance their political uh, program. And then, of course, the, the vast majority of the book is on an offshoot of that, the global jihad variant. Uh, which began uh, in the 1980s. One last point on this slide, the, the jihadi phenomenon, not global jihad, but the jihadi phenomenon in general, which again begins in the 60s and early 70s, uh, you find in both the Shia and Sunni worlds, um, you know, both elements had it. Global jihad, at least up to this point, has been a distinctly a Sunni phenomenon. You don't see a Shia uh, version of it uh, in any meaningful sense. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with what gets captured politically by the Iranian state, but we can talk about that more later. All right, so I make an argument that the, the first wave of global jihad is focused on the liberation of occupied lands. Uh, you can see I date it from 1979, um, simply because that was the year the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, and that was the, um, uh, the event, the crisis uh, that began the uh, global jihad movement. The fellow that you see the picture here, Imam al-Jihad, Abdullah Yusuf Azam, is uh, the father of jihad, as it says, um, is widely seen as, as essentially the father of the modern global jihadi um, movement. He was uh, prolific. Um, he was a trained cleric at Al-Azhar, which gave him uh, religious credentials that most jihadi ideologues do not have. Um, his work has been translated into many languages. Here are the two most important uh, books that he, uh, uh, he published during the 1980s. So what was his idea? Why did, when we say global jihad starts uh, with Abdullah Azam, what, what do I mean by that? And uh, in the book, I go through a number of uh, what I call ideological innovations uh, within the jihadi you know, strategic arguments. Um, and I don't have time to go into each one of these. You can see them on your screen. Um, but let me highlight uh, one that I think is very interesting. And it is a, um, I, nobody else is making this argument. So I want to highlight it. And it's what I call the jihadi international uh, argument that Azam was primary, he was not a takfiri. Um, he wasn't interested in overthrowing Muslim regimes like a lot of uh, his cohort in Afghanistan were. Um, but he uh, instead wanted to focus on the liberation of occupied Muslim lands. In a sense, he wanted to take that Afghan experience, that Afghan model, uh, which he was you know, deeply involved in, and apply it to a dozen or so other places around the world, uh, from Mindanao in the Philippines, Kashmir in, in India, and most importantly, after Afghanistan for Azam, to Palestine. So I want to focus on this um, this this phrase al qaeda al sulba uh, in Arabic, which is a it's a common phrase. It just means the solid base or the solid foundation, and it was a phrase that was commonly used by jihadis in the Afghan jihad in the 1980s, uh, and it was meant as a territorial concept. And, and, and in short, once the jihadis defeated the Soviet Union, took over Afghanistan that would then represent the solid base or the solid foundation al-Qaeda sulba from which to um, uh, carry on operations uh, outside of Afghanistan. In the last two years of his life, Azam reinterpreted this phrase um, uh, and specifically in an article that he wrote in this journal that you see on the top right-hand corner uh, that is in fact uh, entitled al-Qaeda sulba. 
Um, and he makes the argument for what I call, he doesn't use the phrase jihadi international, but it's, it's essentially the argument for the communist international in the 19 teens and 1920s, which was to, uh, for Azam, the need to create a pious warrior class of, of pious, strong, committed jihadis that would, um, and that's the solid base, not a territory, but, a, but, a, but a, essentially a class of people uh, and not just a vanguard, he envisioned it as much more of a mass movement, but again, a, a, um, a pious warrior class that would travel the Muslim world uh, in areas that you have um, uh, occupied, and he uses the word ihtilal, uh, occupied lands. Um, and this was then going to be the solid base. Uh, so very much, again, a communist international um, type view, but applied to the um, jihadi uh, community. Uh, lots of other things with, with, with Azam. Uh, he's the first person to give a sort of a philosophical link to uh, jihad as permanent revolution. Um, has been talked about by Sayyid Qutb and others. Um, again, that's my phrase. Qutb would talk about the daima, the, you know, sort of the eternal or always uh, um, commitment to, uh, to violent jihad. Um, the creation of the cult of martyrdom that, um, that Azam was central for. So anyway, the first wave essentially dies when Azam is assassinated in Peshawar in 1989. And then when his colleague, Osama bin Laden, took his idea to the Saudis after the August 1990 invasion of Kuwait and basically said, look, don't bring in the Americans and the other infidels. Uh, let's do the Jihadi International. Let's take Azam's model and apply it to Kuwait. I, Osama bin Laden, will raise 100,000 Mujahideen and we will fight um, uh, for the liberation of Kuwait and the overthrow of the Saddam regime that way. Uh, obviously, the Saudis were not particularly interested in going uh, in that course. Um, and at that point, the first wave essentially is over. There, obviously, there's always going to be a few true believers still, but um, it, it essentially ends with his death and the rejection of his model uh, in a real world case. The second wave is the one that, of course, most Americans are quite familiar with, the, the Al-Qaeda uh, wave or um, uh, <clears throat> the America first wave, as I call it. It also has specific crises that launch it, the defeat uh, or the looming defeat of the jihad movements uh, in Egypt and Algeria in the mid 1990s, uh, the growing US military footprint in the Gulf uh, following or during and after the, the first Gulf War of 1990-91. Um, and that convinces uh, bin Laden of the need to create a new wave, if you will, a new iteration of global jihad but one that is focused on driving the Americans out of the region. It has nothing to do with liberating you know, far-flung territory in Kashmir or Mindanao, but driving the Americans out of the region um, that would lead uh, uh, then to the uh, uh, easy overthrow of these local apostate regimes. So Bin Laden's ideological innovations, um, uh, or innovation is primarily about flipping on its head this, um, Argument made, uh, you see the picture of the fellow Muhammad Abdus Salam Faraj, uh, Farag, if you want, um, an, an Egyptian jihadi that was the head of the group that killed Anwar Sadat in 1981. He's the guy that created this, um, this dichotomy of near enemy, far enemy, um, as a way to warn against going after the far enemy, which for Faraj was Egypt, or excuse me, was Israel from Egypt. Um, and not to go after Israel, but instead focus your attention, my fellow jihadis, uh, to the regime in Cairo in particular. Uh, we need to overthrow these, these infidel regimes. Anyway, uh, Faraj was hanged for his efforts. You see his book here where he makes this warning at Farid al Khaiba, um, the hidden obligation or the missing duty translated variously. Bin Laden takes that and flips it on, on its head and says, Faraj you know, had the right idea, but got it wrong. We need to focus the attention on the far enemy. We need to drive the Americans out of the region, first the Arabian Peninsula and then expanding out from there. And it's only by doing that that we will weaken the near enemy regimes in Riyadh and Cairo uh, uh, and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so Hans was born the, um, the America first of the far enemy strategy. 
uh, that had its heyday uh, beginning in, uh, in the late 90s with the embassy bombings in East Africa. And of course, its apex was 20 years ago with the 9-11 attacks. Al-Qaeda was uh, decimated with the American invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, its leaders, um, especially sort of second, third, fourth tier leaders, uh, were uh, hunted down, were killed, were captured, um, and, and what's often called uh, Al-Qaeda Central was more or less done by about 2003, 2004. Again, there are always you know, true believers. There's still at least in name a organization um, you know, by that name uh, in the AFPAC region. Um, but it, it, it had its heyday. It had a run of you know, five or six years um, as the global jihad movement um, until um, I, I date the end of this wave of global jihad to 2011 and the killing of, uh, of bin Laden. All right. The third wave is the ISIS wave. Again, it's not about liberating far-flung territories. It's not about driving the Americans out of the Middle East. This is a state-building wave um, and not a Westphalian modern state, you know, post-1648 Treaty of Westphalia, uh, but this is a pre-Westphalian state um, that they wanted to build. Uh, again, it had crises that launched it. Specific crisis was the invasion of Iraq uh, by the Americans in 2003. It didn't go particularly well uh, in Iraq, um, as, as, as David has studied in, um, in, in detail. Um, but they got a second opportunity with the civil war in Syria in 2011. The broader problem, again, not liberation of territory or occupied territory, not overthrow of, of uh, infidel regimes or, uh, you know, Murta, the apostate uh, regimes, but apostasy itself, sinful behavior by itself. And ISIS's goal, and I use uh, the name change over time, but I'll just stick with calling it ISIS. Um, ISIS's goal was to build a pre-Westphalian state in which apostasy sinful behavior um, would be uh, almost impossible. I mean, highly discouraged so that Muslims could lead a you know, pure, uh, pious life, uh, at least in the view uh, of the ISIS uh, ideologues. This third wave is by far the biggest. Of the four waves I talk about, it's by far the biggest. There are lots of documents, lots of ideologues uh, you can point to. Um, you know, I list a couple here, the management of savagery, which was not specifically ISIS-based, but was there was a, just a ton of really radical jihadi literature in the 2003, the 2005 time period with the U.S. invasion of Iraq and kind of asking the question how to respond in various ways. So there was a lot of, um, it was a very prolific time for jihadi uh, ideologues. Um, and Idarat al-Tawahush, the management of savagery, uh, was one of uh, a number of uh, these tracks that were written uh, during that 03 to 05 uh, time period. Again, ideological innovations were numerous. I do want to underline the, the, the pre-Westphalian state building uh, at the center of the ISIS uh, experience. Uh, again, they had a lot of other interesting uh, things, their views on violence. Again, the Idara Tawahush, the management or administration of savagery. Um, ends up being something of a blueprint uh, for how they utilized violence. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, uh, uh, McCants has written uh, and others uh, about the apocalyptic nature of the ISIS ideology that's at end times, uh, particularly up until the declaration of the, uh, the caliphate in 2014. Um, anyway, a lot of the extreme sectarianism was, was new for the global jihad movement. I spent a lot of time talking about what I call jihadi coup. What uh, the anarchists of the, of the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century would refer to as propaganda of the deed, the sort of just do it mentality, let the action speak for itself. Um, and so you don't have much in the way of this sort of long theocratic arguments with the ulama, with the, the, the Muslim clergy about the rightness of the cause. It's more about storytelling and recruitment of young men that, that um, you know, want to have meaning and glory and adrenaline rushes in their, uh, in their life. So the jihadi cool uh, element looms very large in this uh, ISIS experience. Um, 
All right, the fourth wave, the wave that uh, I argue we are currently in, the Jihad Faradi wave. So this translates as personal jihad. It's come into English as leaderless jihad. Um, it is a response to a um, to sort of gloom and doom. This is a, a it's a it's a, a argument about survival after the destruction of the Islamic Emirate uh, in Afghanistan, and then later on the ISIS territorial state in 2017 kind of the looming defeat of the global movement, uh, global jihad movement uh, writ large. The most important um, work was written by um, this man you see uh, in, in the picture, Abu Musab al-Sori, a Syrian from the Aleppo area. He was involved in the early 1980s uh, revolt, uh, sort of round one in the civil war in Syria. Um, People usually refer to him as an Al-Qaeda ideologue. I actually don't think that is particularly accurate. He was much more of an independent ideologue for global jihad. But after the uh, downfall of the regime in Afghanistan, and as he watched the, uh, the invasion of Iraq, he wrote this very long internet book, Da'wat al-Muqawwam al islami al-Alamiyah, The Call for Global Islamic Resistance. And what he lays out there is a, uh, a, again, it's a strategy of survival for global jihad in, in very dark days. He, he, he painted a very dark picture of the situation of global jihad in the first years of the 21st century. It can be summarized by this phrase that he uses, nizam la tanzim, nizam la tanzim. So system, not organization. He wanted to create a system, a modern, 21st century network system that uses modern media forms, some of which he didn't even see. Um, uh, they came, uh, especially social media, down the road a bit. Um, but that uh, is basically a network of what today we would call lone wolves, either you know, lone wolves or small groups that are motivated by the ideology of global jihad, but not connected to any group, not connected to ISIS or Al-Qaeda or some other group in particular. Um, but they're uh, motivated to undertake uh, violent action. The use of, uh, again, social media, the internet, uh, what I refer to as a wiki narrative, and that is you don't just have two or three or four ideologues that can be assassinated. You have a whole community of ideologues that keep, you know, keep the narrative going and morph it and change it a little bit as new attacks are made. They bring that into the corpus. Um, and uh, it, it's there in plain sight for, for all to see. And I refer to this again as a wiki narrative. One last point on this, because this is where, again, as we enter the comparative uh, uh, element here, the fourth wave relies on what has been called stochastic violence or stochastic terrorism, um, and which essentially it's uh, stochastic is a, is a term of probability, right? So when you have influence and calls for action, you can, you can predict there will be an increase in violent attacks, but you don't know where they'll be because again, they're not from groups. Uh, this fourth wave is individually or small group um, uh, autonomous violent action. Uh, it shares a lot in common with the, uh, the white supremacists or white nationalists uh, around the world in, in the use of the stochastic uh, in inspired violence, and it's very much a 21st century form of violence. All right, so in the last five minutes, let me just kind of raise this issue of where does global jihad fit in the broader universe of violent uh, political movements? I make the case, um, uh, this is in the con concluding chapter, that the vast majority of violence over the last century comes out of enlightenment-based movements. Uh, Leninist, or communist, if you will, but more accurately termed as Leninist movements, uh, national liberation movements. And I make the case that even fascism, which most people don't associate with enlightenment, but the element of fascism that, that focuses on modernity, modernization, development, um, which, was a, which you know, was a, a major part of the fascist model uh, at least until the Nazis uh, you know, kind of went in a different direction. Here on the bottom of your picture on your screen, for example, you see Mussolini personally beginning the, uh, the destruction of this whole neighborhood near, uh, you know, right outside of St. Peter's Square, between St. Peter's Square and the Tiber River, uh, which today is this big open boulevard, but it wasn't. It was this neighborhood, uh, you know, very crowded uh, uh, neighborhood in Rome that, um, 
that Mussolini tore down, built up, you know, again, these shiny boulevards, big monuments, uh, big structures, all in the name of, of, of a conservative, but uh, conservative uh, modernization. Um, but there has been some violence um, that has been outside of that enlightenment uh, type model. Ken Zhao at first picked this up in the 1990s, um, who uh, is since retired, but he was at Berkeley for many years and then at, at Stanford uh, at the Hoover uh, for a few years at uh, late in his career. Um, and I've taken his concept and, and kind of worked with it. Uh, and I, I hopefully, inshallah, I've improved it. I focus on two characteristics of what uh, he called, and so I'm just using his phrase, the movements of rage. I focus on the, the element of nihilistic violence, and that's nihilism in the political sense, not the philosophical sense. It's not meaningless violence. It's system destroying violence, root and branch violence. And uh, this apocalyptic anti-enlightenment uh, type ideology uh, that has a strong feature of cultural contamination. And I coined this word nosocide, uh, mixing my Greek and my Latin, Gnosis being knowledge, side being um, the murder of. So the killing off of those with knowledge, um, either literally killing them off or you know, violently marginalizing them and, and, and pushing them to the side. We have a number of cases, uh, again, over the last uh, 100 years or so of these kinds of very violent uh, and weird and usually not very um, powerful movements. They, often are not powerful, but once in a while they are part of a coalition that does become powerful. Uh, the, the exemplar of a movement of rage was the Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia in the late 1970s, right? One of the first things they did was to empty Phnom Penh, the capital city. They uh, either directly or indirectly killed the educated classes. If you wore, wore a tie, if you wore uh, eyeglasses, if you spoke a foreign language, these were all um, signs that you are a carrier of cultural contamination. Um, and you ended up having a genocide of a million and a half to two million people in what is, you know, it was a fairly small country. 10 years earlier, you saw a similar uh, and not quite as violent, but still pretty darn violent movement amongst the Red Guards in China, which Mao took advantage of to kind of ride back into power, but he did not create. This was an autonomously, created movement of rage that again was directed at the educated classes and ultimately sent out um, millions and millions of high school and college graduates, primarily from Beijing, uh, out into the countryside. Some were killed directly, others were just not prepared to, to live under those circumstances. And again, hundreds of thousands, maybe even a couple of million people ended up dying in this you know, back to the countryside uh, movement that came out of the Red Guards movement of rage. Boko Haram in Nigeria before they uh, sort of discovered global jihad themselves, a uh, similar story. Importantly, I make the argument about the brown shirts in Germany, which is what the Nazis um, used for their thugs, essentially, in the 1920s up to 1934, uh, the night of the long knives, when uh, Hitler essentially got rid of the, uh, the brown shirts. He didn't need them anymore. But these were semi-literate, uh, semi-rural or rural uh, white men that would be the thugs at Nazi rallies. And they were themselves a movement of rage that were part of the, uh, an, an influential in the Nazi coalition um, that blamed uh, uh, cosmopolitan elites for all of Germany's problems. Those cosmopolitan elites were uh, of course primarily uh, seen to be Jews. Uh, and I also talk at some length about elements of white nationalism today being a, uh, a movement of rage. Uh, last point is I, I talk about global jihad as a variant form of movement of rage because all the movements I just mentioned were uh, within a certain country. This is a global version of a, uh, of a movement of rage that advocates for nihilistic violence, has an apocalyptic uh, ideology or ideologies um, does have an element uh, of, of no suicide uh, uh, to it. Um, but again, it's at the, the global arena, not at the uh, local national uh, arena. Uh, and with that, I uh, will end and turn it back over to David and I'll get off screen share here. Terrific, Glenn. I, I, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, 
And it was like, whenever I introduce people, I always say, I've asked the speaker, we've asked the speaker to speak for 20 to 25 minutes. I never say they will speak because <laughs> they rarely do, but this was terrific. He, he kept the time. You know, I, when I teach Middle East politics, people are always asking me, not just in students, but what should I read to understand terrorism, 9-11, everything that came after? And, you know, The Looming Tower, I can think of particular books like McCann's book, which you mentioned, but there's nothing that kind of goes into the breadth and, and provides kind of a categorization or a conceptual framework with which to make sense of the changes over time. And so I think that that, that first puzzle that you chat, the first argument you make in the book, I think is terrific. It fills a niche that was, that was really missing. And there's depth there, but not too much depth, right? You don't have 20 pages on, on Kutub, like some of the, some people have uh, felt the need to inflate, include. So I have a, there's a whole bunch of questions on the table. And we have plenty of time. We have till 1215. So we've got a lot of time. Uh, just, before I ask the first question, though, could you say something about different meanings of the word jihad? Uh, you have that on page one of your introduction. I think it's important to put out there that the word has different meanings to, to different people. So if you could just say something on that very briefly. Absolutely. So jihad is just a noun form of the verb jahad or jahada, uh, which means to, to struggle, to make an effort to do something. It is used in colloquial Arabic uh, and, and, and modern standard Arabic in non-religious terms all the time. Um, when, it, um, when it is used in a religious term, it is um, uh, typically used in a, in a non-violent way. It's not the uh, uh, jihad of sight, the jihad of the sword, but the jihad of nefs, the, the personal jihad of personal betterment. So it's a word that has a, a very positive meaning to the, the vast majority of Muslims in the world. Um, because it, it's basically a word in the religious context. It, it means to, uh, you know, to struggle, to make an effort to be a better person, a more pious, you know, better member of the community, you know, better father, husband, etc. So it's, it's, it's overwhelmingly used in that direction or in that way. Um, jihadis, when they use the word jihad, they only mean jihad sites. They only mean armed jihad or jihad of the sword. Um, and, and uh, you know, Azam says that very, uh, very bluntly. This, when he uses the term, that's the only thing he means by it. Um, and so you do have a history of legitimate, uh, within the sort of Muslim clerical sense, legitimate violence when a jihad is called by legitimate authority. Um, the sort of political violence that I'm talking about in this book is across the board illicit. This is not seen as legitimate violence uh, in the name of Islam called by a legitimate religious uh, authority. Uh, so it is, it is routinely viewed as illicit or improper or illegal uh, violence, but this is, the, this is the word that gets used, so I use it. Terrific, so there's a lot of questions. Let me ask the first one then, uh, substantive question. I, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of the, the, the strategist, the theorist of this fourth wave that you talk about, especially Abu Musab al-Suri. The, you, you describe his critique of bin Laden as, as basically making a strategic mistake, that 9-11 provoked the United States to come into the, into the region and decimated, decimated the, the jihadi movement as a whole. And so there's a, there's a sense of strategic thinking, what they did and the, the reaction it provoked. But I didn't hear any sense, I didn't get a sense from your book or the other things I've read on Suri that there's, he's, he's thought about how, what's the strategic effect going to be of the type of violence he's advocating. So I'm wondering if those thinkers actually go into depth or pay any attention to, or maybe they deliberately don't address the, 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 the presumption that such lone wolf sort of attacks are gonna provoke retaliation against Muslims who have nothing to do with, with their larger movement or the global jihadi movement. Is there any concern with the, with the ummah or the effect on the ummah? Or is this a, I, I associate the argument with David Lake. Is it a deliberate strategy in order to provoke retaliation onto Muslims in general in order to radicalize more and more? So some jihadi ideologues have made that argument. Uh, Suri doesn't really uh, uh, go in that direction. What he's looking at is a survival strategy. Uh, he realizes that and recognizes the kinds of attacks that he's calling for are effectively pinprick attacks. You know, you, you can murder a few people at a time. 9-11, um, you know, almost 3,000, but that's, you know, that's kind of way above and beyond what you would normally expect out of this kind of lone wolf or small group type violence. Um, so his thinking was, this is the way to survive. 
this is not forever. This is not, this is just a stage in uh, a longer struggle. Um, but this is where the wiki narrative, uh, and he just uses the word thakafa, which is culture. But um, what he's really talking about is a narrative about global jihad that can be stitched together uh, through the internet. And now uh, again, post Saudi, he disappears from the, from the screen in 2005. Um, but um, the, the sort of wiki narrative that can be uh, utilized on social media and elsewhere to, um, to put together a story about what is happening that makes it more powerful than the sum of its parts, because the sum of its parts are not very much. These are not um, existential, this is not an existential violence. It's not even a major strategic form of violence, um, but it does murder people. Um, and so if you can use modern technology to stitch things together to make it again you know, the, the story that gets told as more powerful than the actual you know murder of a person or two or three from time to time, um, it, it keeps it in the news. It keeps it in the headlines. It keeps uh, um, inspiring others. But the Saudi is is very specific that this is this is just for a while until we survive and we're in a better position strategically. He does return to the notion of eventually we want to control territory. We need a state. We need to control territory um, because that you know that's as we increase our our influence and power, uh, we can do that. They had Afghanistan, right? They had Afghanistan, and Saudi just dramatically criticizes um, uh, bin Laden for, for, for throwing that away for no reason, right? So it was, a, it was a huge blow to the global jihad movement, the loss of territory. Um, and you know, he referred to bin Laden as a pharaoh, which is not a compliment. Um, so there was a lot of criticism uh, by, by a Saudi and others, but a Saudi, I think most of all, uh, of bin Laden. Um, even today, you know, if you look at uh, jihadi writings today, um, there is a certain respect for Osama bin Laden, but just in terms of his personal life story and, you know, giving to the cause and stuff like that. But he is not viewed by jihadi ideologues as a, um, you know, as sort of the avant-garde, cutting-edge type of uh, uh, justification for global jihad. He's widely seen as having made a, a serious strategic blunder. Okay, so let's dive right into, into the obvious question that uh, Chuck Freelich of the Crown Center and others have also asked. Uh, how will Afghanistan uh, today affect the fourth wave and will it create an empowered fifth wave and what might that look like? Um, it, it's a great question and it's kind of the $64,000 question. Uh, uh, and I have my money on, on one outcome, but um, no guarantee. So the, the issue is, will the Taliban, now that they're back in power, uh, will they essentially invite Al-Qaeda and other bad actors uh, back into Afghanistan in a meaningful way, allowing them to train and you know, do all the things that they were doing in the late 90s and early 2000s? Um, I think the answer is probably no, that they won't. Um, but there's a history there. So you can't discount the history and you can't discount the fact that there was intermarriage between Taliban leaders and Al-Qaeda leaders as well uh, with the, of their children. Uh, and that creates uh, certain bonds. My guess is the Taliban want to stay in power this time uh, and they will do lots of, I think, horrible things to their own population. But I really don't think they're gonna make that mistake again, which would only invite uh, external uh, intervention you know, not for 20 years necessarily, but, uh, um, uh, you know, no country, no power in the world uh, will tolerate um, uh, having another country train a bunch of militants to attack it. So uh, I think my, my money would be on the Taliban not allowing Al-Qaeda and other militants to, uh, to form in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, they've also had their, um, uh, I mean, not just differences, they have fought battles with and killed uh, members of what is now being called ISIS-K Khorasan. Uh, so the ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan, there, there is no love lost there. Uh, so I think the Taliban will probably um, resist bringing in global jihadis, and as I said, in any meaningful way, but that's, that has to be watched. That's a $64,000 question. So there were several questions asking us how do specific groups, especially Hamas and Hezbollah, fit into your into your set of waves or your uh, uh, categorization. 
And along with that, since I mentioned Hezbollah, uh, how do you characterize Iran's proxies in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq? Are they, are, is this a, a new uh, in, jihad international, a la Azam, but uh, uh, slightly different? So uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and, and, and uh, a few other groups uh, in that ilk really are not, these are not global jihad groups. Their, their aims are local, right? Mostly territorial. They think that there's um, uh, somebody controlling territory that they want, and they also want internally uh, some version of an Islamic state that they don't think uh, uh, exists. Um, once Israel withdrew from southern Lebanon, it, it, it created some, something of an existential challenge to Hezbollah. And of course, they had to um, you know, make up stories about uh, farmland that hasn't been uh, left yet and this sort of thing. Um, but its, it's uh, raison d'etre was, the, was the, you know, pushing the Israelis out of Lebanon and had a fair amount of popular support. Once the Israelis left Lebanon, you know, then what? Now their, their primary activity over the last decade has been successfully saving the regime in Damascus. That doesn't play very well in, in, in Lebanon, frankly, amongst other groups. So um, both Hamas and Hezbollah are jihad groups, but uh, they're local jihad groups with their own, in this case, mostly territorial um, agenda. In the case of, so, you know, let me rephrase your question slightly. Why don't you see a Shia uh, global jihad movement? Because there's there's nothing in Sunni Islam or Shia Islam that you know would prohibit uh, and prevent something like that from happening uh, in in either uh, in either interpretation. I, I think it has to do with Iranian politics that the the Iranian nation state um, uses these proxies for its own interests, uh, which um, has a religious base but at the end of the day are pretty secular interests about prestige and power and uh, influence and control. Uh, and so they have been very successful in creating uh, or assisting proxies in various countries uh, as a means of, uh, of, of, of a statement of national power. Um, and it really is not a, I mean, there's all kinds of iconography of Hussein and Karbala and all of this, uh, but at the end of the day, this is to advance uh, Iranian national interests in the region. Terrific. Uh, Eva Bellin of the Crown Center asks, how does U.S. policy shape this evolution in jihadi ideology? Are, are these different generations of jihad simply a response to different levels or kinds of defeat of the movement by the United States? To a degree. Hi, Eva. Nice to, nice to hear from you digitally. Um, it's um, in part, yes. I don't, I don't want to go too far down that road that this is all a response to American policy, because it's not. Um, there's a lot of autonomous thinking and autonomous action going on. The first wave gets created uh, very much out of Soviet policy with the invasion of Afghanistan. But it, it, it does get tied up into the Cold War and great power uh, rivalry. Uh, and certainly the second wave, uh, the bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, you know, America first wave is you know, very much centered on US foreign policy. And bin Laden wrote about that uh, at, at some length. Um, but if you look at ISIS um, and the Jihad Fardi, the you know, personal jihad, um, America and American foreign policy is certainly part of that calculation, but I wouldn't even put it at the center. Uh, of, of, of ISIS thought, for example. Again, it's there, but it's not um, central to their program in the way it was for bin Laden. So I think it's a mixed picture. Uh, certainly it's been an element of that, but it's, I, I would say it's just more complicated than a monocausal, this is all response to US foreign policy, which you do see people make that argument. I just think it's too simplistic. So uh, Daniel Neep, who's uh, rejoined the Crown Center, asks a, a, a follow-up question on this. He says you did a you did a great job of portraying the successive waves of jihadism, but what are the reasons behind why jihadism evolved the way it did? Why did jihadism change like this in this particular way over time? Uh, I think it has to do with response to crises, uh, and that you you had an ideology developed to address um, uh, these specific crises. So the specific and and ultimately the broader crisis. For Azam was the occupation of historically Muslim territories. So he came up with an ideology of global jihad that would address that issue, the jihadi international uh, idea. Um, the durability of apostate regimes. Why is it 
that the regimes in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and elsewhere just they they should be falling, according to Bin Laden, but they're not. They're they end up being quite durable, um, and it's like. You know, Bin Laden's version of, of this is the old uh, Bobo doll, um, you know, the sort of four foot high clown that was plastic full of air, but had a weight at the bottom that, you know, he viewed that jihadis would keep punching this Bobo doll in the face and it would wobble, state would weaken, it would wobble, but ultimately would be righted uh, again. And it would be righted because of that weight in the bottom. And that weight in the bottom was the United States uh, for, uh, 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 for bin Laden. So again, he, his crisis is the durability of these apostate regimes. At the same time, the American military footprint in the Middle East and the Gulf region in particular uh, is expanding uh, pretty dramatically. And he, you know, he says, look, these things are not unrelated, right? These are, this is an expression of American power backing up these uh, you know, near enemy regimes. So his crisis demanded a different ideological formulation. So I, I think in all four cases, it has to do with the kind of crisis or crises uh, these ideologues are facing and they come up with ideologies to address those specific ones. Each of the four is quite different from each other uh, as I've, I've tried to lay out. So I'm gonna uh, rework one of the uh, uh, questions anonymously submitted. Basically, these are Muslim resistance movements. And if you label every Muslim resistance movement as a jihad, then why don't you just label every Western invasion as a global crusade? Um, well, I tried not to do that. Um, um, obviously, there is such a thing as global jihad. It is talked about as um, it has a corpus, um, you know, a, a literature to use that word. Um, it is, you know, it's a real thing. Um, that deserves to be studied. And um, does it represent most Muslims? No. In fact, uh, I make the point quite clearly, I hope quite clearly, that this is a pretty marginal fringe movement within the Muslim world, uh, the movement of global jihad. Again, it's interesting. It deserves study. Um, but we don't, uh, and, and again, in the epilogue, I make this very clear, um, right size the, um, the threat. This is not um, you know, a 10 foot high, you know, monster that is so powerful. When, and we, we in the United States and the West in general have tended to exaggerate, I mean, since 9-11, uh, have tended to exaggerate the, the level of threat, the nature of threat. Uh, and, I, and I specifically say that's a, that's a mistake. So, I mean, words are important. Uh, we don't want to do, every, you know, every single thing that a guy who happens to be Muslim does that might be violent is not uh, an armed jihad. And just um, uh, in the same way that uh, hopefully in the 21st century, we're not still doing the crusades, but uh, I think we saw from the, uh, the second war in Iraq, there are certainly some people that still view the world in, that, in those terms. So uh, there's a couple of questions people ask, some people ask long questions, but some people ask about sources and, and how we know about them. So Daniel Neep, for example, says, that, well, if ISIS sought to establish a pre-Westphalian state, how do you explain the fact that what they created in Syria and Iraq looked very much like a Westphalian state? And does this reveal the limitations of placing too much analytical attention on what jihadis say and not enough on what they do? And similarly, uh, Han El Sisi, who's an incoming fellow uh, very soon at the, at the Crown Center, uh, welcome, sure she's going to be able to finally join us very soon, uh, asked if you could tell us a bit more about your other sources for the book. Sure. Um, uh, let me do the second one first, and that is um, uh, uh, all my sources are publicly available documents written by, I mean, all the primary sources, uh, written by uh, uh, jihadis and um, uh, kept in various locations, including uh, in the archive and the internet. Um, so uh, these, are, these are documents that can be uh, retrieved in Arabic. Uh, many have been translated into English and other languages. So um, uh, these are all, I don't have access to, or I, uh, maybe I could, but I don't uh, have access to, you know, classified DOD documents that they have that have never been released. Um, so these are publicly available documents uh, of people in the movement describing the movement, the goals of the movement um, for each other. Um, so it, it is uh, to some degree an intellectual history. Um, in terms of the pre-Westphalian, um, I mean, pre-Westphalian states had uh, some institutional resemblance to post-Westphalian states. Uh, 
right? The, the, the key, so we're looking at state institutions, you know, army and bureaucracy and what have you. Yes, all states pre and post Westphalia have uh, many of the same institutions. What Westphalia did was uh, to address the issue of le the legitimacy of other states, right? So the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, primarily between Germanic states, uh, basically put aside the era of, of each state claiming all the other states are illegitimate, sort of affronts to God and only their state is a legitimate state. No other state is legitimate. And to simplify, the Treaty of Westphalia said, no, I mean, we're going to recognize each other as having essentially legitimacy of having a state. Doesn't mean we won't fight, right? Doesn't mean we won't have wars, but the inherent legitimacy or in, 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 in the pre-Westphalian phase, the inherent illegitimacy of all the other states is put aside um, in the Treaty of Westphalia. So there was a sort of a, a recognition that we may not like the other states out there, but they have, you know, they have some inherent legitimacy that we're not going to question. Uh, ISIS very much questioned that. This is what they never applied to go to, to be a member state of the United Nations, for example. They never asked for diplomatic recognition from other states. They never set up embassies nor asked to do that. Um, so they, they had this pre-Westphalian mentality that all you don't have equal, equal, equality or legitimacy in other states. The only legitimate state uh, in the world uh, was the Dawud Islamiyah, was the Islamic state uh, that they ran. So that's why uh, it's state building, but very much a pre-Westphalian state uh, or view of the world. So I feel like so far, a lot of our conversation is focused on the, the, the first part of the book, uh, which takes up most of the book, even though it's, even though it's a pretty short book, it's, it's terrifically condensed. Um, it's succinct, focusing on the waves, but we haven't addressed this, this argument, provocative argument you make at the end about rage, mo movement, thinking about global jihad as a movement of rage. And so I want to I hit on that with a couple of questions. Uh, Joseph Ringel asks, uh, you mentioned rage as a major theme. Uh, is there an attempt to create a vision for a governing structure? And to what extent is the Islamic concept of justice integrated into that? And it, I don't want to get too long, but relatedly, is there a pattern at, at, at whom the rage is directed at? Uh, Jews, Christians, Hindus, internal heretics, Democrats, et cetera. And what political role does this rage provide? And is there anything that comes after the rage or do these, do these movements fold in on themselves? So there's a bunch of different things uh, hidden in there getting at unpacking this, this uh, I, per, per poorly chosen word rage perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I actually spend a little time in the book discussing the word choice. It's uh, the phrase movement of rage was Jowett's original phrase. I, I don't think the word rage is really the right word. Um, uh, but, you know, he coined the phrase, so I want to be, uh, uh, you know, honor that, uh, that uh, academic legacy. Um, so let me start with this. Um, one of the interesting things about ISIS, right, it's, it's the state building uh, version of global jihad of a certain type of state. Um, it rarely got into any significant theological arguments with leading clerics uh, around the world. Bin Laden did that a lot more, incidentally, than, uh, um, uh, than ISIS ever did. ISIS was not, again, just to generalize, ISIS was not interested in convincing the ulama of the justness and the rightness of its cause and what it was doing. Um, and so it, it never really spent time trying to do that. Uh, and the, 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 you know, the high ranking ulama around the world, um, uh, not a single one ever recognized the caliphate and you know, did a bayat to the, to the, to the new caliph. Uh, um, it just didn't happen. Um, and so there was a, a wide gulf between, in this case, ISIS and the traditional uh, ulama, traditional clergy um, that uh, across the board rejected uh, what ISIS was doing as illegitimate. So traditional notions of justice and things that you know the traditional ulama are you know very protective of and are concerned with, you don't you just don't see that. And at at um, I mean I don't want to say at all, but it's it's a fairly minor part uh, of what ISIS was doing. And I think again the absence of their engagement with the uh, high-ranking ulama around the you know, Sheikh al-Azhar and others, uh, their, their, their lack of engagement with these people uh, suggests that you know, 
they they themselves probably didn't uh, weren't convinced that their arguments uh, passed uh, historical traditional muster when it comes to um, to the uh, to the ummah and the Islam concerns of the Islamic community. Again, it points to the kind of marginal uh, impact uh, of ISIS. Now, the, the, the meaning of the word raid. So again, I define these as those two characteristics I, I mentioned, nihilistic violence and apocalyptic uh, ideology as these distinctive features of this, this distinctive form of violence that you see, you know, I mentioned the number that are both religious and secular, um, but all of whom have this uh, uh, affinity for nihilistic violence. So what I mean by that, Nihilism, and I again get into this in the book, has both a philosophical and a political meaning. The philosophical meaning has to do with meaninglessness. I mean, it's just sort of the meaninglessness of life uh, and, and uh, you know, kind of these broader existential issues. Um, that's not what we're talking about. It's, it's the political nihilism. And again, this gets back to uh, the Russian anarchists of the latter part of the 19th century that use the word nihilism in this way, in a political way, meaning just over the top violence, right? System destroying violence, root and branch violence, not meaningless violence, but it's so meaningful, but, but way over the top. And, he, and you just look at, you know, Bin Laden calls for, and I had the, the uh, Puzzle newspaper up where Bin Laden and Zawahiri and uh, Faita, who's uh, another Egyptian uh, jihadi, you know, issued this quote unquote fatwa in 1996 um, that calls for the killing of Americans everywhere and a no distinction made between military uh, and uh, civilian. So that is, you know, it's not that it got implemented, uh, thankfully, but, but that's a call for uh, nihilistic violence, um, and again, I point out similar things with uh, with with the uh, with the other waves, and then the second characteristic, the apocalyptic uh, ideology. Again, this is very important. Um, th these are end times, right? This is there's some nirvana that we're about to enter. That nirvana, uh, you know, you saw that very much in Cambodia, for example, in a, in a Maoist secular. Uh, regime or supposedly, and, and they would talk about this new Khmer civilization that's going to be reborn as soon as we you know, get rid of this cultural contamination. Um, so um, there is this um, uh, apocalyptic uh, nature to the ideology. And again, there, um, um, uh, 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 McCann's has written a, a book on this and other people have as well. Um, so there's a lot of evidence out there about the apocalyptic nature of, in this case, of the ISIS uh, ideology. Those two variables, when they are present, and they're not present in most political movements, right? They, 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 they tend to be fairly rare. But when they're present, you're probably looking at a movement of rage. I, I, there's finger footprints earlier than in the, in the book that I didn't. I, I, I'm starting to see more clearly now. So, for example, you talked. I didn't realize how important Abu Musa al Sudi was to the, the violence in Algeria and the GIA. And you, you, drew, I read Brinjar Leah's book, but I didn't. Uh, for some reason, I don't. I didn't remember that from it. Uh, but this is a uh, uh, fits very well with this idea of movement of rage that you're talking about and, and, and developing a, a, a logic to it, if for lack of a better word. So there's a whole yeah, bunch of good. If I can follow up on that, because that's a great point. I mean, his relationship, and this particularly when he was living in Europe, his relationship with the GIA in Algeria, the kind of violence practiced by the GIA ends up being very similar to the kinds of violence practiced uh, by ISIS. It's almost a sort of a, I don't want to say a test run, they're not connected in that way, but, but the sort of the understanding of the logic of violence of gory, um, uh, symbolic violence, uh, primarily against civilians, um, is, uh, again, what happened in Algeria in the 90s uh, presaged what happened uh, by ISIS uh, in, the, in the 2010s. So a lot of great questions, and I I'm, I'm apologize in advance, we won't be able to get to all of them. But uh, Make a Cog, and I apologize if I mispronounce the name, asks uh, a, a really interesting question uh, about the emergence and spread of the internet and social media. What influence did it have on the development and shape of the subsequent jihadist waves? And I, I, I wish I had combined that earlier with Daniel's question on why the waves took the particular shape they did. So you can say something about that. With that fourth 
the fourth wave, would it have been possible before the internet? Correct. Absolutely. That's exactly the point. So if you look at the evolutions, uh, you know, starting, let's start with, with, with Al-Qaeda and the, and the second wave, their messaging was very sloppy, right? It was amateurish. They're, 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 you know, there's, there's, there's not really an internet to speak of um, uh, in the 90s when they're, uh, when they're starting to do what they're doing. And they were just, they were always very clumsy. ISIS comes along and their messaging strategy, they're able to take advantage of the, uh, the internet and then later social media. Um, and it's much more sophisticated, much more professional. It's all very gory, right? I mean, this is the thing you see primarily when ISIS puts out a video. I mean, this, this scripted uh, symbolic violence, um, you know, I had a picture up earlier of the burning of this Jordanian pilot, right? Watch the whole video, right? And this is all, you know, this is all scripted. It's professionally done. It's gruesome, but that's the point, right? Um, with the fourth way, the sort of networked uh, violence, absolutely inconceivable uh, before the internet. Right, you just you, you you couldn't have that kind of a network. Uh, the networks were created mostly just face to face. How do you create networks in the 21st century? Um, you know, face to face stuff gets people captured. Right, they they're moles, uh, spies, etc. You can get rolled up that way. Um, but if it's uh, using social media, the internet, 21st century information technologies. Uh, it allows you to network and, and never be in the same city uh, with another person. Uh, and you can be inspired by groups or individuals or what have you, undertake an action uh, if, uh, if you're so inclined uh, without any kind of logistical support uh, from uh, any group uh, out there. And, and that's, that's even in the late 20th century, that was an inconceivable form of violence. But one last point on that, which is interesting, the people that first, at least in terms of I can tell in my research, the persons, the people that first came up with that notion of stochastic, you know, internet-based violence, essentially, stochastic terror, stochastic violence, where you have essentially plausible deniability by leaders because they didn't wire money or do anything like that, they'd call for violence, right? They call for certain things to happen. Uh, and they can't control if somebody actually does something, right? This fourth wave. Um, the, the people that, that first, as far as I can tell, the people that first thought about the use of the internet for this kind of violence uh, were white supremacists in the United States. Uh, people associated with KKK, one guy, in, in fact, who's a, a very uh, a leading white supremacist who just died last year, or two years ago, maybe, um, was, you know, he wrote about this, this, this kind of inspired, again, what today we call stochastic violence. Um, that was just, you, you couldn't even imagine that back in the 1980s or even the early 90s. So if the Harul uh, Bashar asked a question that I, I would read a whole book on, uh, at what point does the jihadist movement start to co-opt women and why? And uh, General, could you say something about how the four movements differ in their engagement with, uh, with, with women, either as, uh, as participants or as uh, viewers of what they're doing? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question, and and I look forward to David, you writing a whole book on that because uh, I, I I'd learn a lot. But you know, just very briefly, these are um, it, it, the the people that I'm reading. Um, you know, from Saad Qutb and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini back in the '60s um, to you know modern jihadi, global jihadi ideologues, Abu Sabasuri and others uh, today, um, or in the more recent period. Um, they all come off as highly patriarchal. Um, these are not people that subscribe to women's rights. They see women in very traditional uh, ways. Um, you know, there was an interesting discussion, I, getting back to Hamas for a moment, which again is not a global jihad movement, um, of uh, the, this is back during the Second Intifada, of the potential use of women as suicide bombers. And there's just a whole lot of, of Islamists and jihadis that are, you know, uh, totally reject that notion. Um, and, and so it, it tends to be, you know, pretty patriarchal, tends to view women in, um, you know, as the makers of the home, the carriers of the children, uh, uh, et cetera. And so again, it's, it's, it, they tend to take a pretty traditional, very patriarchal view uh, of society. 
So short question from Sam Bahur. How much does the continuation of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories feed jihadism in all its forms? Basically, can you, can you map what's going on in Israel-Palestine to any developments in this uh, global jihad in its four waves? Yeah, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, uh, it, it, I think it used to be more important, um, uh, particularly with the second wave with, uh, with Al-Qaeda. Um, and just compare, uh, just focus on that for a moment, compare bin Laden's 1996 uh, declaration, not uh, a declaration of, of war um, um, with the 1998 fatwa, right? Bin Laden spent, I mean, some people make the argument that bin Laden was all about Palestine. This was, this was, this was his issue, um, which, is not supported by the evidence. And other people make the case that uh, Palestine was totally unimportant to bin Laden. And it's only when he sort of goes global does he latch onto it. That's also not supported by the evidence. The issue of Palestine was always important to bin Laden. It wasn't the most important thing. Um, the uh, occupation of the, what he called occupation of the Arabian Peninsula um, beginning in 1990 was for him a much more important uh, issue, but it was important. So the 96 document talks about Palestine and other issues, but, but Palestine is, is certainly there. It's one of the, the things that he points to for this war uh, against Islam led by the Americans, right? So Palestine is, is an important issue, um, but it's not the central issue. Um, by 1998, he's he's learned marketing essentially, uh, and he's 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 you know he and four other people put out this so-called fatwa, uh, which he of course did not have the credentials to do, and he actually called himself sheikh in this, so he got a lot of pushback for that, and um, no, never did it again actually. Um, but then Palestine was one of the three issues that he pointed to, uh, and he kept pounding the issue of Palestine in a way that he didn't in the 96 document where he spent 90% of his time talking about you know, inside baseball in Saudi Arabia, right? Inside political stuff that Muslims outside of Saudi Arabia don't care about and don't know about. When he does go global, right? In 98, when you have this announcement of the new organization, it's global jihad, um, Palestine then becomes a regular uh, point. And, and why? Because this is an issue that, uh, and it's not just jihadis, I mean, kind of lots of people can point to as um, uh, a, a, an affront to the Muslim world, an injustice, not an affront, but an injustice to the Muslim world um, that has never been fully addressed. And as long as it remains uh, unaddressed, it will be uh, a, um, uh, may not be the major, but it'll be one of the major uh, recruiting tools. And I don't, I don't see that changing uh, anytime soon. So our colleague here at the Crown Center, Pascal Menere, asks uh, two very distinct questions. I'm going to ask them both. One is, your genealogy of jihad as a military movement is very short, uh, 1979, and doesn't take into consideration earlier movements that use the notion of jihad to ward off slavers, colonialism, the Ottomans. Uh, why is that? Why 79? They look like global jihad. He doesn't say this, but they look in many ways like global jihad movements as well. And the second question, again, which is quite distinct, uh, but allows us to come back to the movement of rage uh, a piece of the piece of the book. What do we gain analytically by comparing armed movements responding to Western or Western back occupation and or neocolonialism with Nazism or fascism? Um, so the first question, and hi Pascal, um, the um, the banner of Islam has been used for um, for political violence, war fighting of uh, forever, I mean, uh, since the beginning of Islam. Um, and so you've had, um, I mean, not, uh, for example, the expansionary wars of Islam, some were called jihads, many were not, right? The, the conquest of Spain is not referred to as a jihad, it's referred to as the opening uh, of Spain. Um, so, I mean, jihad has a history, a very, very long history. And in the anti-colonial uh, movements in the 19th century, early 20th centuries against the French, against the Italians uh, and others, uh, 
um, uh, there were, you know, clear references to jihads and, um, you know, kind of fighting under the banner of Islam, which is one way, depending on which country you're in, but in North Africa, for example, uh, in Libya and Algeria, it was a good way to unite um, uh, tribes under the under same banner to fight against the Italians or the French. Um, but these were national, right? These were not to overthrow a system. This was just to drive out um, the, um, uh, the European colonial power, the imperialists. Um, if Abdullah Azam in 1979, again, that, as I mentioned, that year is used simply because that was the year that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and kind of started this process. If Azam had just said, look, it, this is a jihad, the Afghan jihad is what it was commonly called. And once we drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan, khalas, we're done, right? That's, that's, uh, that's the end of it. Um, then there would be no first wave of global jihad. Um, which never really got off the ground at the end of the day. Um, but he didn't, right? That Azam then envisions this model in a global way, uh, that this model should be, this jihadi international model can be transported uh, to uh, other places to help local Muslim communities free themselves of, uh, of infidel occupation in the same way the Communist International was designed to go different places to free local communities from uh, bourgeois exploitation. Right, so it's a very similar uh, view. So it's because this view went global uh, under, that began with Azam in the 1980s or December of 79, if you wish. Um, uh, this really starts it and makes it uh, something that's quite different from the anti-colonial uh, struggles uh, in, again, particularly 19th, early uh, part of the 20th, uh, 20th century. Now, in terms of what we gain uh, analytically, I think there's something to be said um, um, for those forms of violence that are not enlightenment-based. Uh, again, having those two characteristics that I, uh, that I talked about, um, that make them distinctive, um, that have, uh, that, that bring, I mean, what I don't wanna do as a comparativist is just say, you know, well, this is something that, you know, happened in the Muslim world and it's, you know, forget about it. It's, it's only, it only applies there for some idiosyncratic, um, maybe orientalist uh, rationale. Um, this is a form of violence that we see elsewhere. We see on other continents, we see in other cultures, uh, at other, um, I, mean, I, I limit it to the last hundred years, the last century, but it is a comparative form of violence that is united by these characteristics that make it um, kind of analytically distinctive from the vast majority of the types of movements that we have seen around the world uh, over the last century. So I think analytically, um, it is important to, um, you know, to say, hey, wait a minute, this, what we're looking at is really kind of a distinctive form of violence, I mean, not just the global jihad, but these other movements of rage, they're not very powerful usually. Um, they murder people, but they don't take over generally. Um, the couple of examples we had have been quite horrific, um, but it's a it's it's a, an unusual and distinctive form of violence. It's quite different from what we're used to studying in you know social movement theory and collective action uh, analyses uh, of political movements uh, in, uh, in around the world. So we're we're just about out of time. There's a lot of great questions on the table, and I. Just we want to ask you the last one that just came in. Who killed Abdullah Azam? But we we don't have time to to talk about that. So what I encourage all of you to do is that we're gonna we're gonna email the questions to Glenn uh, and feel free to reach out, engage with him. Uh, his e his email you can find on his website glennyrobinson.com. Uh, he's also pretty easy to track down. Uh, he's tall. You'll see him. Uh, so feel the feel feel free to reach out, engage with him uh, about the book, which is widely available. And uh, uh, before I uh, in, uh, ask you to all join me virtually in thanking him. I just wanna mention our next Crown Seminar is in two weeks. We're going back to our normal day, Wednesday. And again, our seminars are the first Wednesday of each month. And our next speaker is Zahra Ali, uh, who's at Rutgers University, but is on leave at Princeton at the Center for Advanced Study, uh, which I'm jealous about. She's gonna talk about the Iraqi uprising and the political imagination. So she's gonna be talking about the, the mass protests that have been going on in Iraq since 2019, but she's gonna be using that to theorize uh, what do uprisings and mass protests tell us about power and about redefining uh, 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 the theoretical imagination uh, of, uh, in relation to life, violence, space, and emancipation? It sounds uh, quite, quite interesting. 
so please join me though now in uh, thanking Glenn Robinson for a fascinating talk. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing all of you at our next seminar. Thanks.